That is us. That's us streaming, Rob. So on to your introduction. Wonderful. Welcome back, everybody, to Fantasy and Puppetry, a celebration of the art of puppets and puppeteers in bringing fantasy and fantastic to life on page, stage and screen. I'm going to begin by giving you a sense of what's happening this afternoon. So at, uh, at 1 30, just, uh, just quite soon, we're going to be having a recorded interview by Terry uh, again, this time of her friend and neighbour, Todd or William Todd Jones, as he's formerly known, master puppeteer for the BBC TV series, His Dark Materials, and much else, as you will hear, who will talk to us about bringing fantasy creatures to life in film and TV, with another short question and answer session afterwards. At 3 p.m., we'll have a talk from the actor, director, puppeteer, and activist, Howard Gayton, who'll tell us about bringing fantasy creatures to life in the theater. Then there'll be a break for tea between 4 and 4.30 p.m. And at 4.30, we'll have a round table discussion focusing on puppets and puppetry in fantasy narratives with many digressions into the world of performance. For this, we'll be joined by the Hugo Nebula award-winning author, Mary Robinette Cowell, who also happens to be a puppeteer, and Marita Arvaniti. Uh, an experienced that theatre practitioner who's writing a PhD on theatre and fantasy here at the University of Glasgow. So welcome back, and uh, and I look forward to uh, to your company this afternoon. So we're now joined by the puppet, we're by the puppet designer and uh, performer William Todd Jones, Todd, who will be interviewed by World Fantasy Award-winning author, artist, and editor Terry Windling. Now, the interview is pre-recorded because Todd's engagements meant he might not have been able to join us today. Fortunately, however, he can be present for the short question and answer session that follows the interview. Now, at our recording session, we had a few technical issues with the clips from the various movies Todd has taken part in. So we're going to be sharing those clips via email through Eventbrite after the interview. Warmest thanks to Todd for his thoughtfulness and generosity in sending them, them to us to make sure you can go over them afterwards at your leisure. As Todd and Terry talk, please type your questions for them into the Q&A function you can see on your screens. We'll do our best to pick them out and ask as many as we can in the limited time available. So Todd will be talking to us about bringing fantasy creatures to life on screen, drawing on his unrivaled experience in uh, productions from Labyrinth to the adventures of Pinocchio, from John Carter of Mars to his dark materials. Please give Todd and Terry a very warm welcome as they join us from their home in beautiful Devon. Apparently. <laughs> Welcome to the second part of the Poetry and Fantasy event. Um, we're talking to William Todd Jones today, who is a puppet master. He's a designer, a performer, and an absolute expert on creature effects for film, television, and the stage. Now, what many of you may not realize is a number of the people talking today all live in one small village. So if you saw the last event with Brian and Wendy Froud, that was just outside the village in their little thatch roof cottage. Now we're down in the village at Todd's house. Later today, you'll be at my house where my husband, Howard, will be talking about puppets for the stage. And um, so it's a real chat for production today. We've all known each other for many, many years. Todd has known the Frowns since he started his whole puppetry career with working with them on Labyrinth in the early 1980s. So I'm going to start by asking him to give us an overview of his extensive career in this field. Yikes. <laughs> it's been a long time. And one of the really wonderful things is being able to share it over the course of years with people here in this community and yourself in particular, both from a professional point of view, personal and social, uh, to have the support system of others who are involved in this peculiar world 
you know, just up the road for a cup of tea or something, <laughs> depending on what time of the day it is. Uh, but it, it's been really glorious to have a, a journey with all of these people. So thank you, Terry, for that introduction. Um, to business, I guess. Uh, what I have is a few shots for you uh, and important bits of things I think uh, are the core of my performance and my career and my ethos. Uh, it's a bit up on the screen now about memory being captured and being told, retold a story, which is very, very important. And we're just going to advance a shot. And this is uh, some of the stuff that I've done, which will give you a potted version of my career. The uh, first bit is John Carter of Mars, uh, where I was teaching stilt walking, and I was uh, John Carter's lovable friend, Wooler, um, who was a sort of mixture of an axolotl, tadpole, and dog, moves really, really quickly. And in this particular shot, uh, my wife recognizes the sort of stubborn movement. And <laughs> despite, no matter how many legs I have, I seem to be recognizable in the sort of manner in which I walk. And uh, here we go, Batman, I was the cape. And for the cape, it needed some puppeteering with bits of string or rods inside it, or there were different versions, depending on what Michael Keaton as Batman was doing in that 1989 movie. Uh, but all sorts of things, it was considered that the, costume itself and the cape in particular were was a creature uh, and then we moved to Jessica Rabbit. Uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was probably my favorite movie and it may seem odd that there were puppeteers in this but where a physical or live object like a tie is being moved then it needed a puppeteer to do that so I was weasels and various other things but Jessica Rabbit was probably my favorite one to uh, be uh, as cool in uh, Harry Potter, uh, in that I did the motion, the motion capture for the character. And then on set, I had a 16 foot puppet that gave the eye lines. Uh, a baby in a large tank of water was the ghost of Christmas past with Michael Payne, Muppet Christmas Carol. Done lots of Muppets over the years, lots of creatures. And that sort of naivety was wonderful and still lasts for an audience. And lots of robots, you know, the other, end of the spectrum, sort of serious sci-fi, but it's still puppeteering. I was wearing a slave control system, and as I moved, the robot moved and lost in space. But there was a very direct performance quality. And here, my first big performance role uh, was one of the principal puppeteers in Little Shop of Horrors, uh, manipulating Audrey too. Uh, and with that movie, you know, it. There were lots of us wiggling bits of rubber, a half ton of rubber at one point, in order to achieve an overall performance. And there's uh, Judge Dredd, where I was the ABC robot, and in Labyrinth, which uh, those of you who have already been watching today will have heard quite a bit of, no doubt, from Brian and Wendy Fry. Uh, and I got to hold Toby, their son, on a piece of wire. That was one of my first stunt things, or rather he was being dangled there. And then um, finally, in this little series of clips, uh, there's Ross, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, where I was various Vogons performance, uh, performing there. And ultimately, I meted out, oh, I achieved my long term ambition of destroying the Earth. <laughs> and there we go. So, um, as uh, Terry said, you know, as you're saying, it's a sort of start on Labyrinth with Jim, who was an extraordinary mentor, very, very generous. Jim Henson. Jim Henson, yeah. The great Jim Henson. Yes, and who's been here to Chagford on you know, numerous occasions and worked very, very closely with Brian and Wendy, first on The Dark Crystal and then on Labyrinth. I started on Labyrinth and did two years building puppets and then wiggling some of them at the end uh, in some of the bigger shots. But it was really the grounding that May, helped me understand that it's an illusion, that fundamentally what you are able to achieve with these props is you are bringing something that's dead, literally dead, inanimate to life. Mm. And that can be with quite simple movements, but you are reliant on the audience's mind. However, the audience has been trained to look at shots, at TV screens, you know, 
If it's in there, it counts. Outside of there, it doesn't count. So whether it's close up or wide shots, uh, or looking over there when something is happening because puppets can't do it, which is often the case. It was an extraordinary grounding to be on Labyrinth and to see all the different uh, rigs that we would build for things in order to achieve the gags, to get 106 minutes or whatever it is of a movie, which is a coherent narrative. So I've been all sorts of creatures and in these slides up here to see a few other bits. So there's, uh, there's me as a troll, uh, and me as a centaur, this was in the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, there I am with um, Batman um, <laughs> as the cape, oh, uh, and a robot in Lost in Space. So uh, again, that was the slave control system. And another favorite movie of mine to be on, because it was just such a bonkers thing, was John Carter of Mars. Uh, and for John Carter of Mars, I taught stilt walking and did lots of stunts as various tharks. Uh, which mostly involved either killing people or being knocked off my stilts uh, in the desert of Utah, which is where we shot. Uh, Willem Dafoe was astonishing in that film, you know, in that he uh, learned to walk on stilts. And one of the things that we did in order to help train him was uh, have him play American football with my son David on stilts. <laughs> he was great, you know, within the day he was doing it. Now, the, one of the things with the, sort of my career is distinctly that. Uh, there is no dignity. <laughs> you know? uh, and probably one of the worst things is green light bread, which I had to wear an awful lot. You know, this picture of me from John Carter indicates that. So the, the picture on the... Sorry. Can you explain why? Um, Briefly. Yeah, so for those who are familiar with filmmaking, thank you, Terry. <laughs> yes, I sort of need to explain what, why. Uh, in filmmaking, Oftentimes, you will be doing something that needs to be cleaned up or replaced, you know, completely overlaid, that there may be a component of it that is kept and the rest of it is scrubbed out. Uh, and green, that horrible color green, uh, oh, maybe not so horrible, but, uh, you know, worn and very tight lycra is it's not very pleasant, particularly in the desert where it's very hot and you get sand in all those places. Uh, the green is easy to remove, but with its color separation, and you can clean it up afterwards. And what you've taken plates of the area with the camera, so you replace the background where I was with the actual background, and what you see is the thing I was wiggling, and hopefully not me in green or anybody else in green. But there was always a need with uh, a lot of what I do, I should say, for these major special effect movies is really very simple basic puppeteering that people need things to relate to you know we'll come on to that more when i talk about his dark materials i'll show you examples but for john carter mars a favorite thing for me um, for those of you who don't know the movie i really recommend that you watch it it got panned it didn't do well at the box office uh but I think it's really got some exceptional design and characters and performance in it. Uh, it's a lot of fun, it's epic, it's a big romp. And a lot of other uh, films have taken advantage of some of the design of that to take it on. But one of the shots that needed to happen was John Carter has crashed in the desert and his faithful hound Wooler, which was me, you know, <laughs> uh, I sort of did all the reference for that and the characterization. I couldn't run at 200 miles an hour, but they did that in post. <laughs> uh, I have a, uh, his hound was meant to see if he was all right. And the way hounds do, uh, I was given the opportunity, uh, I asked the director if it was okay. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I got a wet sponge and went on to set in my green lycra. And at the appropriate moment, I licked John Carter from groin to ear. And he went, ah, the actor did that. And everyone went, yeah, great, got that, moving on. <laughs> and they, they removed me, my greenness and my sponge and oh, uh, replaced it with the full CG Wooler character. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's interesting is that you've moved, and we're going to get into this next clip, you've moved from Labyrinth, where yeah. it was very much a, a film that doesn't disguise the fact that you're working with puppets, yeah. into films where a lot of people won't even realize there are puppets involved because by the time the film is rendered and completed, 
there it, it all looks so real. Yeah. And perhaps beginning with this, you can explain that process. Well, it, all I try and do, well, I, I use anything to help tell the story. I mean, fundamentally, uh, if a piece of string works, I say I'll I'll use a piece of string. You know, it could be just as simple as moving something a little bit in camera. Uh, but sometimes you have to do more complete versions of the, these characters. I've done a lot of motion capture, and people, if they've played Xbox games, have probably killed me a few times. Mm -hmm. You know, as various creatures, you know, being trolls, dwarfs, giants, orcs, and things like that. The thing I've never been able to do really is men, because apparently I don't look like one. <laughs> you know, when, when I walk in motion capture, it doesn't look, work, look great. But, but there's not a clear line anymore between puppeteering, motion capture, animation. It, it, it all kind of blends together in the work you do. Yeah. Uh, all it is, the, oh, there, there's a fundamental thing. There's a story to be told. There are beats in the story. Uh, and there are characters. The rest is, well, how do we do that? How do we create the illusion? Uh, as a person, you know, I can wander around. That's re really straightforward. As I said, I've never done that. I've always been something else. Uh, but actors can be themselves. However, if you have these fantasy creatures, then uh, who are important as characters in the narrative, then some representation of them is really important. Now, whether that's as the puppet in camera, as has been done in Dark Crystal, and that's the real thing, and that's the end result, even if it is cleaned up a bit, you know, because they're rods, yeah. right? It's a CG uh, rotoscoping or cleaning up afterwards. Or if it's a full VFX, visual effects creature, there still needs some sort of interaction. And, you know, there's a really simple thing. Yeah. Like, if I am sitting here as a troll, which I could be in my green or my with my shiny markers that are capturing my data as I move, uh, then maybe that troll has to take a drink. So, you know, it reaches down, has a glass of water. Thank you very much, everybody. Ah, nice, done, and puts it back. So the prop moves in space, and then my body would be overlaid with the final creature, whatever that might be. So in some sense, you become, you embody the puppet. Very much so. And it might only be a part of it, because I've been massive things, dragons and things like that, where I might only be a, a very small part, like an, an eye line or a mouth. Sometimes I just do mouths because they have to nibble things, or sometimes I just do a claw. You know, that's really hard to act for an actor, whereas if it's happened to them and the eye line is all working, yeah. then it's a complete moment and then can be animated over. Shall we go on to this clip, which we show some of this? Yeah, so um, it's really, you know, the great thing in advances in technology, you know, although this clip is from a couple of years ago, it's a real time render of me wiggling around. And hopefully there's sound on there.
I've left enough time there. This isn't the version that I was expecting to see. So this goes on longer than it should and buffering. So we'll replace this afterwards. Okay. But it should end uh, if we shadows have a fair to think that this more is an end. So it's the puck. And so good night and to you all. So that's that bit. And that's that's similar to some of the techniques you used on the Harry Potter movie, isn't it? Very much so. So my body uh, was captured in a motion capture studio uh, that was put into a video that gave everyone an understanding of the shots. So the camera lenses. And you were playing? Uh, Grawl. So Har uh, Hagrid's brother. Uh, so the whole motion capture of his, his body, his rhythm uh, in the scene, and we did all the shots and the angles, and that, that was played through monitors on set uh, that the director could see and the camera people could see so that they lined it all up properly in terms of where this 16 foot creature could be in the edge of frame. Mm -hmm. So I knocked one over and I picked up Hermione, uh, according to the story. Now, there were various ways in which we did that, but one of them, the, the overall rhythm was done in motion capture earlier, played live on stage. Also on stage, I was wearing a 16-foot puppet that uh, could give all that interaction, and my beats were exactly the same as the video I previously recorded. So for every shot, for every angle, uh, they knew I knew where to be, so they could act. And the you know the kids were great. It was really extraordinarily uh, a lot of fun being there. You know, a great opportunity to play, to pu do puppets, and have people believe. And then the interaction I was able to bring onto the stage made it a, a more lifelike performance. So that's something I've heard you talk about in relation to your work on his dark materials. That a lot of people want to realize that the demons and the other creatures in the film started with puppets. Yeah. And the purpose for that is to give the actors something, something real, not not something rendered, but something real in real time to act against. Yes. They have to. You know, it, it's uh, just as I did to you earlier. It's like <laughs> that. That's really hard. And your reaction then, you're the laughter and the eye line, well, that's natural. Uh, without something there, I think you get wooden performances, which are sort of what was happening in the 90s for a while in some of those movies yeah. where they were revisiting things and trying to do them with, with CG or computer graphics. And but actors were, were just acting. I, like, like, where am I? I mean, yes. you know, in front of a green screen or whatever it happens to be, there was nothing to perform against. So one of the things that has been quite wonderful for me in my career in these last years is puppets are back. I remember that that <laughs> that curve because yeah. there was that stretch where all of you puppeteers that I knew in film suddenly <laughs> were were not getting work no. because the CGI seemed to be taking over yeah. everything, and then it was discovered largely by me all pushing for it yeah. that no, we need puppets here even if you don't see them in the final piece. It, absolutely, and this sort of takes me back to my time with Jim Henson. You know, one of the things he said is, puppets don't do very much. You know, they can do of the whole alphabet that goes to write Shakespeare, let's say, uh, which is, you know, the number of consonants and vowels. Puppets probably in their performance can do maybe two vowels, maybe five consonants, and you've got to make, to make everything work from that point of view. So then that hits this snag of the desire to have ultra realism. You know, it's not a puppet show, it's a computer graphic character, fully animated, interacting. So there was this point at which puppets became unfashionable. Mm -hmm. um, and they had been rather overused. They, it, it's like, oh, not another puppet <laughs> in, a, in a movie. Trying to, uh, there's some hideous failures, except the other thing that Jim said is, it's like a palette. And on a palette, you have various colors. And in order to create your painting, uh, you bring all those things to bear. So motion capture, visual effects, special effects, costume, uh, puppetry, 
They're all just colors on a palette that you use at the appropriate time to help create the story. And you know, back to story and character. Well, maybe this is a good time. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the stage work, and then we'll oh. then we'll then we will move into uh, what we really want to okay. dig into here, which is your work on his dark okay. material. But I am, you know, using those same techniques that I have used for film and television. I've also done a lot of stage stuff, uh, including big puppets. So that this puppet is, in effect, exactly the same puppet that I used for Grawp in Harry Potter. Uh, into uh, it uh, had a bit more cladding on it at that point. It wasn't <laughs> uh, the skeleton that you see there, but it's the same sort of idea with the hands and the reach. And I was able to give uh, Harry a poke with that with those hands. And then uh, the next one is an indication of a uh, sort of very very sophisticated semi photo reel, though it's from an animation uh, characters from Ice Age. I toured the world and when astonishing opportunity really to can you explain what ice age is uh ice age is a series of animations uh animated films from the early 2000s i believe and uh, it had a, uh, it was a sort of buddy movie uh but the characters rather than humans happened to be creatures from the ice age so it's the saber tooth cat diego and there's sid the sloth and hey man uh, yeah i'm not fat i'm just that uh, poofy <laughs> um and i got to perform manny in front of two and a half million people live around the world so it was recreated as a stage show a stage show on ice <laughs> so the, the puppet totally mad. totally mad it weighed uh, 400 pounds 200 kilos uh, I sort of buffed up quite significantly while I was doing that, doing three shows a day. It was a lot of fun. There were two of us in Manny uh, in order to dance it around the ice uh, with Olympic standard ice skaters doing triple salkas every show. All I had to do was... That is Rivera puppeteering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, for me, the, I mean, this is a an anecdote, and I know I want to get onto his art materials, but the beautiful thing performing puppets live is you have that re uh, relationship with the audience. Mm. And after every show, no matter how tired I was, kids came up to hug Manny. Oh. And you know, the rule for me, the discipline was, I'm not Todd, I'm Manny. Mm. So we never came out of the costume, people uh, and have children getting snuggled in that trunk and I have some very poignant stories learning the stories of some of these children who came to see Manny after the show and those are some of the most extraordinary memories I will have in my career and the other thing that was really rather lovely about those performances is after the show you know we'd be going from an arena which is maybe two and a half thousand seat arena and we'd be uh, getting onto the metro or tube or a bus, something like that, with the audience. And you get to hear these kids say, oh, did you see? Oh, you know, that, that was so great. You know, they met their heroes. With no idea that you They had no idea. I was hearing there. those heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, in this shot, you can see the quality of these creatures, which are very close to the animated characters that appear in the films. Uh, and then I went on as Master Puppeteer with an affiliate of Cirque du Soleil to do a version of a series of animated films called The Nut Job. Uh, and that performs mm -hmm. uh, you know, significantly across Canada. Having the opportunity of putting incredible gymnasts in costumes means <laughs> you can get a heck of a performance. But that also meant I had to build or design creatures and puppets it didn't simply break when they did a triple loop. Uh, and then the, most recently, the thing that's now out on the road uh, in America uh, for Warner Brothers, uh, also using some Cirque du Soleil performers in them, uh, I helped did a design for Scooby-Doo because I was really, I, I find it, I thought it was really important to get a character that was not like a mascot, it was not just a stage furry, mm. but actually looked like Scooby. So while making or doing the design that somebody could wear, because also it's three shows a day, you know, for five years, 
there, there had to be a resilience to it. I also spent quite a lot of time trying to insist that the person in the suit stands like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got, get arms together, <laughs> you can't spread. So, uh, I, I did that remotely actually through uh, COVID over Zoom, which was very strange to try choreographing Scooby uh, at a distance. And then, his dark material. So you were the beast master. Yeah, yeah master puppeteer, uh, head of creature effects. Yeah. I wanted to have the term puppeteer be in that, uh, but it's also quite difficult because you know, these were multi-million dollar uh, episodes of a series. So there's an awful lot of money at stake. And so it's something that sometimes bugs me, you say puppets and uh, executive producers go, mm. yeah. and, and then they go, how much? <laughs> so, so for those who don't know, this is a, was a television series yeah. for BBC, HBO, yeah. and filmed in... It was filmed in Cardiff, Cardiff uh, yes. at the studios there, Bad Wolf Studios, where they do a lot of Doctor Who. Them. And also uh, in nice Oxford. for you being a Welsh boy. Going oh, back to Wales. I I found it extraordinary to be able to go back to Wales because I'd rather run away <laughs> from it, you know, gone to America first and then back to the UK and London, where by John Labyrinth, uh, because the the economy there was very much collapsing in the late seventies, early eighties, and uh, I didn't want to go down the pit. I didn't want to be a miner. Or, and as it turned out, all that was going anyway. Uh, I went off rather Billy Elliot-like and sort of became a dancer. Uh, I was never going to be a great dancer. You know, I'm more of a rugby player than, <laughs> than I am a, a lead dancer. But I could always lift people. <laughs> and I could always do visceral performance on, on stage. And then happened to find, thanks to Jim Henson, that actually I was pretty good in a big furry suit. <laughs> and so did lots of creatures there. And that you know, sort of has taken me on through puppeteering. Uh, but it was, so this was the first time back in Wales in 30 odd years. Mm. Uh, and to go there with permission to set something up because that was, it, this was on a scale with creatures and puppets that really had not been done. So you were kind of inventing what you were doing as you went along. I was. I'd done it in bits, and other people had done some as well. You know, whether it's the Star Wars stuff, uh, or I, I wasn't on Star Wars, but um, Neil Scanlon's studio had done incredible work of getting puppets and creatures back in front of camera. But this, the determination here was to have proxies so that the actors could interact. There, there was... No way realistically that we could do much that was live. There's, there's some shots, and that saved them a lot of money to be able to do that uh, in terms of. So you build For all a, the creatures. Yeah, so building an actual creature that can, could the, be cuddled. The bears. Yeah, that you could interact with. Uh, but the majority of them, I would suggest, were uh, proxies, puppets that were moved to represent the final. CG animation, computer graphic animation. So that the actors could act with yeah. them. So whether it was a snake inside somebody's jacket or a bird sitting on an arm, because it's really important to understand the physicality of these things. Now, uh, for his dark materials, I, I, everyone was asked, well, what's your demon? You know, the, the inevitable thing, if you know Philip Pullman's stories, uh, uh, you will probably, and you've read them, you probably go, mm, what, what am I? What have I got? So I decided I was going to be a Pine Martin, which turns out um, in the first series to be what Lyra fixes as, Lyra Blacko. Uh, and Philip Pullman rather liked Pine Martin too, so there's a, a shot of him uh, cuddling one, or cuddling our stuffy. Uh, and the reason we built stuffies that were sort of okay for in camera is just a couple of seconds of movement and holding, well, you got it. It's in camera style. There's no animation that needs to happen afterwards. And pantomime appeared in so many forms, as so many in so many shots, that just to have almost a doll puppet representation, not manipulated by somebody on the outside, but held, cuddled, 
the weight of it, the weight of it, the scale of it, the eyeline of it, the interaction. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you know everybody watching this will at some point have played with dolls. Uh, and We're that's stuffed the, animals. Yeah. Yeah, so you you you, ooh, you you can do something you can do something there, and you it is astonishing quite how much money that saves <laughs> if you don't have to fully animate it. So Philip Pullman liked uh, pine marting, uh, and if we move on, I'm going to show you, uh, and there it is. That's a, a fully rendered version of the pine marting pantalina in the shot, and then our puppet version, which is really just here for eye lines. And to, in order to ensure the camera knew where it was, and you could set up and we got the lighting appropriate. Now, what we're going to have a look at now is uh, some of the making of these puppets, just to show how really very simple and basic they are, mm -hmm. and adhere to those rules of puppetry. You know, it's, uh, for me, there's a really important thing about using these, and I think the little blurb that I put in there hopefully indicates that for people. Fundamentally, it's about getting the actors to believe, because if the actors believe, then so are the audience. And here's some of the rehearsals with puppets, bits of animation that show what happened. Uh, Lyra holding a pantalime and his learning. Uh, there's uh, Brian performing the golden monkey. And then there were various other shots there of how this is built. Uh, so all the same techniques of building for creatures and puppets that people would be familiar with for stage shows, mm -hmm. you know, the, all of it is this, the same. Some of the materials that I get to use, uh, a bit funkier, there's a bear in the background <laughs> there, uh, because the budgets are somewhat bigger, but the techniques are very much the same. Anyone who has built any puppets would be familiar with this sort of thing. And here we are creating Kaiser for the Witch Queen. And bits of foam stuck together and mechanisms. And this may seem quite sophisticated, except it gives a possibility of interaction. Mm. You know, so when the actress playing Serafina Pecula uh, was there, then it could move. And one of the things that are important, if you have a bird as a demon and you want to let it to rest on your arm, you have to move carefully with that in order that it be believable. You don't move too suddenly. And this was something we spent a lot of time with the actors, getting them to understand that they have to give a point for the bird to settle. And that if the bird takes off and it's got a long wingspan, they probably need to get their head out of the way. <laughs> so in that, this video, you, you'll see various of the styles of puppetry that we use. And here's a quick clip of something that uh, is a sort of more finished result. Mm. So one of the things I thought would be valuable for people to see is just how basic these things are, but have some quality and character. You certainly have the ability to have eye lines. You see where it's looking, what the intention is. There can be breath there. You know, it has some life. Uh, you can go from our proxy version to the fully rendered final version and see, you know, that it's a useful reference within the frame to say where the camera or what needs to be captured. It's good for it was good for Lyra and Mrs. Coulter to know, oh, it's over there. So even though their dialogue was with each other, there was this presence of the golden monkey, and having a thing representing that was just enough psychologically mm -hmm. to help give great attention to the story. But it's a puppet, and then fully rendered. Uh, Ruth was amazing. <laughs> you know, it, it's a great performance as Mrs. Coulter. And we always felt that if we could get the relationship between Mrs. Coulter and the Golden Monkey right for that series, the rest would follow. There had to be a, a believability in it, mm -hmm. but this was the monkey is an extension of her, mm -hmm. of Marissa, and it's painful. 
And then, you know, as sometimes, as I mentioned, you just need a little furry something that can be not quite in shot, but enough in shot that gives the actor something to fully play with. So they, in fact, are puppeteering themselves. Daphne, as Lyra, was brilliant. She had no problem in believing. You know, children mm -hmm. tend to, their imagination is great. They believe anyway. It was some of the uh, older actors that I had, a, had to do more performance with. Like uh, Estelle Maria, uh, when one of the things that I needed to, we, we discussed how uh, Lord Asriel would command a room. Well, if you have a snow leopard, it sits one end of the room and he can be the other end of the room and that's the room sorted. Mm -hmm. Nobody can whisper, <laughs> no little hints. So I was uh, lying down in front of the fire with my puppet uh, and that was overlaid afterwards with a, a full CG representation of Stella Maria and the voice was added. Uh, but there was a moment, a, a sort of beat within it, the dialogue where the master was uh, chatting away and I just went, <laughs> and he sort of jumped and it was perfect you know it's like we got we got the moment uh the presence of a large snow leopard at your feet can change your mind about things <laughs> even if it's welsh and rubber <laughs> and the other thing that needed to happen is the puppeteers who were doing these proxies sort of needed to understand the gates of something you know the, the walk patterns, the, spe the pacing. So we did lots of, well, before every shot, we walked the whole thing through, which would give an, a, an absolute rhythm to the whole of the scene. Mm -hmm. So a snow leopard walking into a room, well, what is that? <laughs> you, you go to nature, you look at how they might pad and what their senses are and how they might smell and look, and it with confidence. <laughs> so there's a so exactly the same as you puppeteer anything, but then completely painted out or what I was. Now, Daphne was great fun to play Lyra. Uh, and you'll see a number of images where she's just teasing me. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's Hester and Lee Scoresby in the background. Uh, and the balloon and fully dressed and lit on green screen, as you can imagine. So that could then be uh, overlaid into a whole backdrop in the skies. Mm -hmm. And this, the sequence that you're gonna see a couple of shots from is where the cliff ghasts attack. And even though very little of the cliff ghasts were ever going to be seen in the final uh, episode, I thought it was important to have some representation of them there so you can get a good reaction. You know, if there's something coming through the web in actually, you sort of want to see that thing coming through. <laughs> and hear it. Uh, with Lynn. And, and so a lot of the puppets were, were maybe never seen, except having a thing there creates the environment. Mm. That sense of reality for the actor. Yeah. And if, it, if it's real for the actor, it's going to be real for the audience. I, I'm convinced of that. And I think that that's why puppetry is back in uh, special effect movies or mm. whether they, whatever genre it might happen to be in. But if there's a creature in there, then it's, you need to have a thing performing that, whether it's sort of contemporary with the uh, creatures or uh, mythical, fantastic, sci-fi, uh, I, I've sort of done, or, I, it's been surprising how many things I get called to do, which most people will never know. Mm -hmm. Probably a good thing. And in fact, if they know that I'm there, then I failed. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So here we go, Panzerbjorn. Yes, because uh, Lyra heads north and uh, an extraordinary opportunity because I've always, I've loved these books since they came out. And my daughter just, tell me I've got to read them. And we ended up getting two copies because we both wanted to read them at the same time. And the idea that a bear is going to look after you, you know, that big friend yeah. that is going to come and sort things out and there can be a, an equality. So you are small 
and um, vulnerable, but Yorick is there. And that was a, 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 a principal focus in trying to develop this character and all the puppet rigs and gags that we had in order to make him hero. You know, and sometimes you just need to see how big he is. So we made uh, versions that could stand on its hind legs or be on two legs, that give, could give a good eye line, that could move through sets, could knock things over. Uh, where he is shot, and I'm going to just let him, he's just come out of the church, and here's a little clip of the stunt. Boom. And I've got a second one of the other poor stuntman. Now, puppeteering tends not to be that painful. I think being a stuntman is, because they have to do this. But the value of having a physical thing there gives everyone the focus. You can create the frame, so you can see how much of the frame it's going to fill. Uh, all the beats are there. You know, it, it's uh, full steam ahead and go. But one of the things that's really, really hard to do and very expensive with computer graphics is physical interaction with hair. So what we did was uh, have a, a, a full stuffy of Yorick with very expensive fur, but not as expensive as computer graphic fur mm -hmm. uh, that Lyra could interact with. So when she's lying on it, in that first conversation when Yorick agrees to take her uh, and uh, to go to meet Yofa Rackmason uh, in the Bear Palace, then they have a sort of cattle and uh, these moments of conversation. Uh, and so the immediate thing is if it's cold and there's a bear that's warm, you're probably going to cuddle the bear. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do with computer graphics or nothing there. So we got sections of fur that was, uh, I had woven especially uh, by an extraordinary company who've done things like Chewbacca and all sorts of other creatures for film and television. Uh, and all the stuff that I had done for the Ice Age show, uh, which is based in Boston, uh, fiber, national fiber technology they're called. And, they will make you anything on looms that are from 1905 made in Bolton, <laughs> Lancashire, shipped over, and that they've been providing the furry fantastic for films and TV and theatre for some decades now. But they knitted me especially uh, a polar bear pelt that I was able to then drape over things so if Lyra snuggles into it, it's possible, and we don't have skin replacement and fur replacement in computer graphics for hyper realism that's very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about cost, it's about believability, because it's much easier to snuggle into fur. Mm -hmm. And then the actor who played Yorick, he, uh, his face was motion captured live time, so there was a full performance. We worked specifically on his breathing. My son David sort of helped him on a day-to-day -day basis, so just walk as a polar bear and <clears throat> breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole beat, and you think of the architecture of his body, the anatomy, where the skeleton is, the weight, so the breath, all puppeteering techniques, exactly as you would do. Uh, and then he was on set with proxy versions of Yorick, uh, with his face being captured, like I was was in that motion capture video earlier, uh, where he did the lines, the performance. Daphne as Lyra had somebody to interplay with, so there was a spontaneity about the performances. Uh, and then afterwards, all that could be overlaid with the computer graphic Yorick. So. You know, that's the final shot. And sometimes, and there's also the thing that uh, Yorick is written, which uh, that was a challenge. <laughs> you know, how do we get 
uh, so 11 year old actress to gallop on a polar bear and not hurt the actress and make it believable. And uh, so they asked me to design a rig, which I did. I did various versions, ones that you could just wear and she could uh, sort of sit on top of it. Uh, and others that would be this, in the space that you could interact with like a head. Uh, when in the Bear Palace, uh, Yulfa and Yorick fight, then we needed a representation of that because the only human in that whole set was Lyra, you know, Daphne, as the actress playing Lyra. The rest was all, uh, there was a massive set, but all the bears were going to be computer graphic within it. So we had to have representations. Uh, and again, my son David and the uh, sort of workshop manager Elliot wore these rigs and went through the whole fight scene uh, so that everyone understood how big these things were when they stood up or when they were down padding around on all fours uh, in order to um, get the scenes from all the angles because it's not, the, it's not one telling of the scene that happens. It's told from many different angles and then edited together you know, to give you the drama and the interaction. So it's fully choreographed and therefore we had to repeat the action for every different camera angle. Mm. And as I say, it, we needed to have a girl ride a bear. And my feeling was I do horse ride and I know that other representations have had put Lyra behind the shoulders. And I felt now that it, it loses the immediacy, the interaction, the possibility of communication between Yorick and Lyra. And if Yorick is galloping across an icy waste with a girl on his back, he's going to be careful. So he'll, change, he'll accommodate with his gait. And we looked at it at, in depth to get the gait right, but we felt to have her just behind his head so she could snuggle in and hold on would work. And I then went and uh, designed and had built a quite expensive puppeteerable rig that Daphne could ride. And here it is, uh, my daughter Ellie on it, just testing it out. Uh, but this might look very sophisticated and it may not look a lot like a bear, but the important thing that I think that anyone looking at this should recognize is the point at which Lyra's bottom touches Yorick's neck is the only important thing there. Mm -hmm. So I had to have uh, a neutrally balanced, it's air damped with hydraulic rams, puppeteerable, so it's directable, rig to just move her bum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, so we had, the size had to be exactly right. Uh, the gait had to be right. And this could go from a walk, a padding walk to a trot. And for those who haven't studied polar bears in a run, <laughs> and I spend an awfully long time doing this. In fact, I've done it for all sorts of animals. It's my particular interest is how, well, how is it really moving? How will this be believable to an audience? Not only does it go up and down at a certain rhythm with a particular movement of its legs, it also goes slightly side to side, slightly off center. Boom, boom, boom. You know, to do that. So we had to do that with her because her action on it then had to match the proper gait of the of your polar bear walking, jumping, turning, galloping underneath. And then the rig that we finally came up with would be able to walk in front of green screen. So hopefully you can see on your screens now that. And then with that rig, you'll see on the shoulders, very importantly, the fur that she could interact with. And I've got a little shot from our actual green screen shoot in studio where you can see, well, her, fur, her hair is moving, her coat is moving, she's moving, there's a big dynamic on it. And there's just a bloke on the inside puppeteering it. <laughs> so it's not a mechanical. My, my thing with computer driven motion rigs, I feel I can always see the gears moving or the, the repetition, the math, maths of it, whereas it, it's a bit like the difference with a, a drum machine. I know drum machines have got a lot better, but it, it's 
absolutely perfect. And you don't you want it to be more jazz-like. So it's just slightly offbeat yeah. or it changes and it's directable. And of course, you know, the thing with having a ride on there is I just wanted to have a ride. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of my experience on dark materials. But there's a really important shot, which um, this for me is the favorite thing why I thought, I've done it. So myself and the team who helped me build all these things and perform them and the production who gave me permission to do this and the hundreds and hundreds of different puppets and proxies and rigs we did, bits of stick to push things, rigs to lift things, lifting people, you know, the various pantalimons, Stel Maria, all those characters. So it comes down to me to one moment, which is where Lyra is saying goodbye to Yorick. And we had enough there at that point to make that believable. And this is an extraordinary poignant moment in the series for me, because I felt all these different colors on the palette that Jim had talked about were being utilized and worked. And for an audience, all they're going to see and all they're going to believe is a girl saying goodbye to a bear. Mm -hmm. Boom. Beautiful. Tyler, I will never forget the day when we sat, you were in Wales, I sat in this house with your wife, Carol, a good old friend of mine. We were celebrating her birthday and we looked out the windows and there was a bear staring <laughs> in at us because you had brought one of these great songs as a prize. <laughs> yeah. And uh, poor, poor Carol has been surprised <laughs> many times by all sorts of things turning up again. But it was um, extraordinary. Yeah. The magic you can create with these with these rigs, with yeah. with their movements, even when the full puppet isn't fleshed out, just through through the movement, you believe it's there. Yeah. That's the intention. So the points, the fulcrum points, the axes, the geometry, and the weight you give it create the character but all you might have is a plastic head and a stick <laughs> that is the puppeteer's art though yeah that, yeah that's it in a nutshell yeah all right so i'm not sure how much time we have left but i want to make sure we talk about what you're working on now okay so uh <laughs> i was contacted last autumn by a director from Iraq called Mohammed Al Daraji, who is uh, Oscar nominated, award winning, and he has filmed in various countries, including some in Iraq. And he said, Would I like to come to Iraq and help him re envision with creatures the Epic of Gilgamesh? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, blimey. <laughs> So I've been familiar with this story for decades. You know, it is the first known epic. It doesn't mean it's the first, but it's the first known one, certainly. And it was discovered in about 1860 when translated from clay tablets that were discovered uh, in uh, ancient Nineveh, which is near Mosul in Iraq, uh, from maybe four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and it's an extraordinary story in that it, it's about a king who's not very good, who's into partying, but actually discovers uh, and then gets very frightened that he's going to die. So he's seeking immortality. But in his journey to find immortality with his friend Enkidu, who's the wild person, uh, he comes to a realization that actually it's doing good, doing things of value in life that will give him immortality because his story will be told that it's futile to seek life forever but you can live on in story so that's that's the really simple basis of the gilgamesh epic or part of it uh, it was going to be reset to 2019 in modern day baghdad and uh, what you have there is uh, a sort of major civil unrest 
where people are trying to push it back against corruption. So this is an actual event, which Mohammed, the director, was attending. Uh, and he spoke to the crowd before they started to cross the bridge. Uh, what you have in the picture is uh, a view from my office on the banks of the Tigris in Baghdad. And then uh, in the background, you'll see a bridge. And in the next image, what you'll see is the bridge back in 2019 with all the demonstrators on one side and the police on the other side. It was not, it was bad. Uh, 800 people died, mm -hmm. were killed in the demonstrations that happened because of very, very aggressive uh, actions by the authorities and by militias. You know, this is a pot that has been stirred continually. Iraq is not at ease and has not been for a long time. Uh, the story of the film revolves around a little boy called Chum Chum or Jim Jim, and he's played by uh, Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf I got to know really well. He's nine years old and all of the young people, the children, the street urchins, based upon the truth of that world of, of Baghdad, um, all of the young people in the film are themselves orphans. And all of them have first-hand experience of the horrors of con living in conflict. Uh, but the story is really very much from his point of view. So in it, um, his, uh, he grew up in Mosul, uh, near Nineveh, very close to where the story of Gilgamesh was founded. And his father was a security guard in the um, museum there. Uh, which is, although this is a fictional story, there was a person in Mosul who tried to protect the antiquities, the, the extraordinary statues. Uh, so, it, um, and unfortunately, they were killed trying to protect them. So, this is all through the mind of a child. So, we got him to do some drawings. I can't show anything more because obviously. We haven't finished filming it yet, uh, and it's non-disclosure, and it will come out, and I hope people got to see it. But if you imagine through the eyes of a nine-year-old child, there's the family when it's all going quite well, uh, and those are uh, images of the Lamassu, which is the winged bull, and of Gilgamesh with Enkidu in his hands, uh, as described four and a half thousand years ago. But in the story, the parents are killed, we find Jim Jim as an orphan in Baghdad, but he's over, he's watched over by the Lamassu, who's the protector of the ancient city of Uruk. Uh, and, uh, and he also, Gilga, surely Gilgamesh will come and save him because he's known these stories all along. And the interesting journey, I think, for the audience is to go, well, is he deluded or is it real? But is the child deluded? Is the, yeah, is the child just. Uh, having a, a fantasy, you know, because it's such a terrible backdrop. Is this PTSD, you know, or is there some real things there? And I leave it to uh, people to go and see it to find out. But I think you know, for me, this is uh, a little bit on the screen is important, and this is sort of some of the last lines of the film, which does end with a satisfying conclusion. <laughs> it is not a horror, it is a, a, a film of hope. What an exciting thing to be doing. Yeah. I know another project you have going back here at home is you're creating a live public show for children on the subject of climate change. And, um, and one of the characters from that <laughs> show uh, to end our talk today. <laughs> So who is this? Oh, hello, Terry. <laughs> hello. <coughs> Are you all okay up there? Hello. Um, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you again. And I think the reason I'm here is uh, to sort of express that it's not easy being green. <laughs> No, I won't go into the whole song, but my friend Jim, when I uh, first was introduced to him, he said, you know, people want to believe and puppets can help them believe 
and give them some hope and teach them some things. And actually, this is all it is. It's just me. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming and have a look at my life. It's been quite, quite an interesting meander. Thank you, Madam Catfish, for joining us. And thank you, Todd, for opening up some of uh, just a just a corner of your work, because I know how much more you've done than you've even talked about today, but we'd be here all day if we got into your whole career. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, a real pleasure to hear from you about the things that you do every day to bring the fantasy texts and the fantasy stories and myths and the folklore that we all love to life. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a cup of tea now? Now you were going to tell us a little story about Jim and Frank Rock, and then we'll end. Oh, oh yes. Um, you promised to tell this story because I like this one. So I'm going to do this without nettle catfish. We shouldn't do this in front of everybody, but you guys have seen enough to know it's about your imagination whether things are alive or not. Um, Jim Henson, when I first met him and worked with him on Labyrinth, uh, he very much became a, a mentor of mine, giving me permission to do all sorts of things. And it was extraordinarily painful when he wasn't there, because I thought there was a long journey ahead. You know, I, was, I was just at the start of my career. Uh, he supported so many people in beginning and listened, which was an extraordinary thing. <laughs> you know, I'm from the valleys of Wales, kind of a ballet in America. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm really going to do. And I happened to be in this workshop being surrounded by Muppets and creatures mm. being, that we were building for Labyrinth. And he told me about um, the ethos behind Fraggle Rock. And for those of you who might not have seen it the first time around, uh, it is just being made again. There's an, a new version that's coming out, a contemporary one. But the original story is really so simple. It's about people coexisting and people with their differences all being a valuable part of society. So how do you do that with puppets? Well, uh, there are three main sets of characters in Fraggle Rock. Uh, they're the Gorgs who live above ground and they, they're sort of the force on the outside uh, that keeps people them together on the inside and the society. And they're the doozers who build things continually. Uh, and they're the Fraggles who eat what the doozers build <laughs> continually. And there's a sort of slight antagonism between them. No, it's not too much, but the reality is there are in society, you know, those who do, and then there are also those who sort of enjoy and are a bit more free in their thinking. Um, and if the Fraggles didn't eat everything the Doozers built, there'd be no space left to build. And that if the Doozers didn't build, there'd be nothing for the Fraggles to eat. So it's simply put about a coexistence within society of people with disparate or different values. Uh, that can, by their own actions, survive. And then the fun songs, <laughs> you know, and they're colourful. And they're, there's, it seems very simple, but it's it's very deep. And when you look at Sesame Street or the Muppets, and the films that were done uh, with uh, the Jim Henson organisation that I've been fortunate to be involved in since. That sort of ethos of coexistence and acceptance of different types of people, of them as themselves, not trying to force them into something else. That's been an extraordinary gift, I think, to uh, us culturally. And uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about that I hope is going to happen is I'm going to try and I'm working with people hoping to set up Sesame Street in Baghdad as an Iraqi version, because it will pass those values on and help educate uh, culturally as well, um, about society, as well as sort of literally in terms of learning the number, whatever it is, or you know, learning to count. 
uh, for those young people there who have been pretty much abandoned. So after all the talk of these extraordinary special effects and all the razzle dazzle of film and television, it's just nice to hear you go back to basics with a puppet on the hand. Yeah. And the values that you take, whether it's a puppet on the hand or a whole world of creatures for television and film. But it's all about about community, yeah. about interrelationship. And um, I've always seen that to be part of your ethos as you, as you work, that yeah. every project you take on, if it's not there to begin with, you infuse it with that. I think there's a value in puppetry as a tool for storytelling. And I think as a species, our stories and the retelling of those stories is the thing that gives us the continuity and a means to a future. That's a perfect place to end. Thank you, Todd, for welcoming us into this place. So, uh, oh, yeah. We're going to become puppets ourselves now. <laughs> <Not now. laughs> and thank you all for joining us in this magical house with this very magical man. Um, and I hope you'll come to the next couple <laughs> of events today. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you for watching and bearing with me. <laughs> and thank you, Terry. Our pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed that talk as much as, as I did. Uh, I found it fantastically moving um, uh, as well as informative. Uh, and now we have the very good luck to have uh, have Todd with us. Um, I hope he's going to uh, he's going to reappear in a moment, and um, and hopefully uh, he may have uh, he may have brought brought a friend or two with him. I'm, I'm not I'm not quite sure yet. Um, I'm going to uh, going to wait until until we see Todd again before uh, before pressing on. But I'm going to have a quick look at the questions and see what we've got for the time being. Please continue to put your questions into the question and answer uh, question and answer function. Hello, Todd. Great to see you. Pressing buttons here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Fantastic to see. What what a fantastic talk that is. Now I'm so sorry about the technical glitches, but it came through magnificently, uh, even with those. Um, so we have. Um, I have my my little quick list of questions beginning to emerge now. Um, Okay, so um, we've got one from Luna, uh, and she would like to know, is there an entire team researching how the real animals behave for you, or do you do that yourself? I love animals. Uh, I grew up in the valleys of Wales as an only child. I spent a lot of time running over the mountains there with the dog or looking at other animals, riding horses. Had always an intention uh, to become a vet at the time. I, I was so fixated. And in fact, my relationship with animals is generally better than one, the ones I have with people, except those who are very patient with, with me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was never academically going to be able to become a vet. Uh, and as it turned out, I ended up becoming an animal. Uh, and th this was pointed out to me by Douglas Adams, who was the uh, writer of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when I was walking across Kenya with him I being dressed as a rhinoceros at the time. You know, he said, like, <laughs> you've achieved it, you're there. And in a very fortunately, in, as a result of the sort of uh, position I'm allowed to have by people, you know, I get into places where others don't. I get a little bit of kudos. I can get to meet with presidents and various politicians and discuss things like climate change. Uh, so possibly, this route uh, as an animal, as a puppeteer, has given me more clout when talking about things that I am really passionate about, which is the natural world. Um, my wife and I have three kids. All of them are biologists. So I'm not sure if I just bullied them into it. <laughs> Actually, I think they are equally passionate about the world themselves. My son, in two weeks' time, is flying out to Mozambique with a costume rhinoceros to do some interaction with the populations engaged with communities there about poaching 
uh, also taking out a, a science project looking using ecoacoustics to discover uh, biodiversity and habitats. So it's sort of finally, a generation later, we are mixing it all up, but still with art at the heart of it and science combined. I like to use the term STEAM projects. I, I think people might be familiar with STEM projects. So science, technology, engineering, but art and maths. Uh, and I have a lot of steam to give off. <laughs> I'm so glad you've spoken about puppets in activism, because that's one of the things that maybe we've all uh, seen a great deal of in, in recent years. Uh, just recently at Glasgow COP20, Glasgow's COP26 conference, uh, we met up with uh, little Amal, who'd walked all the way from the borders of Syria. Um, I, I think I might be right in thinking that there's a little bit of activism poking in over your right shoulder. Uh, am I... <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, if you can go anywhere, you might as well go with the rhinoceros. That's magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what your son is going to be walking to. Uh, w where's he going with it? Um, this one is going to Kenya in the middle of June a project there about reforestation and also engaging with local communities. Most people in Africa, you know, will never have seen a rhinoceros. Uh, people here will have seen many more than they will have seen. If they see anything, maybe it's a buffalo uh, coming to charge them or, or um, uh, an elephant eating their crops. It's a conflict with nature that very frequently is the reality of people there. Whereas if you can personify some of the spirits of nature and bring them through in that sort of ancient shamanic tradition. Now, I don't need to go anywhere further than the indigenous populations who tell their stories you know, in cave light and on the cave wall, you know, there's, a, you know, there's some sort of bird of prey in shadow, you know, which is, is puppetry. You know, puppets are great props to help illuminate a story. And I find rather than me as an older white chap, telling them or suggesting to them that there are other ways you know, of living with nature uh, rather than uh, in conflict uh, with nature. Uh, a creature, a puppet is a really great tool to do that. I have a, a few more questions for you. Um, Jill was asking, uh, you sp spoke a lot in your conversation about beats in the performance. Uh, could you elaborate on what that means in a puppetry performance? Breath, very frequently. It's not much more than that. So breath is rhythm, life. It indicates emotion. So the beat that you have, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's complex that there are different levels of it. If I was doing it at the stage, I would try and embody a creature, even if I was visible, you know, I'd send the focus into it and I'd think of its motion, you know, and the interaction that you might have. Uh, so that beat comes into it. Uh, the energy, the dynamic of a thing, you know, you can change the beat. So I mentioned jazz earlier, and I think that that's a really important thing, that the metronomic perfection is not life. It's machine. You know, we sometimes imitate the machine, but life is dynamic and messy very frequently. And so puppetry, for it to be effective, you have to include some of that messiness. But also, as I was mentioning, you know, Jim's analogy that puppets don't do very much. So you try and find the moments where it works, that you, it helps you tell the story, the story beats. So for those people who are writers, you know, you will have this way of navigating through a story that you'll get to, to the moment. This beat has to happen. It's very important. It's uh, emphasized, high lit, and, you know, then you move on and you, you get people on that journey with beats is what I'd suggest. I loved your analogy with jazz. You were talking about the, the, the person inside the polar bear. Uh, among other things, so the, ja the, the jazz musician inside the polar bear. That was a wonderful <laughs> idea. Um, well, it's really very hard, uh, as I say, for those, I, to go back to your earlier question, I do study animals, creatures, movement, even if it's a fantastic thing, something that doesn't exist in our understanding of reality. You know, I've done lots of bugs and fish, whales, all sorts of creatures, dragons, 
they still apply, that laws still apply. Uh, so if you are trying to convey something to an audience in our world, uh, where the gravity is such, there's an expectation if the volume is such, the mass is such, then it will have an effect. Dust will fly up, compression will happen. <clears throat> I do that quite a lot with the with various creatures, trying to work out the gates, the center of gravity, and also back to breath. <clears throat> Sometimes I don't even need a rhinoceros. <laughs> People have been commenting on your brilliance at making the noises. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, it life sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael had a question which I was quite curious about as well, which is uh, what happens to the puppets after the films are made? Uh, so, for example, where is Ludo from from the labyrinth? Oh gosh, I had Ludo for a long time, or one of the Ludos, and a whole tale because I uh, helped come up with a design for Ludo's tail and built it. It's based on a sort of ancient toy snake you know, that articulates like that. So we wanted it to move in a certain way and, and bounce. Uh, and the mask I had for a long time, I lent it to people. It never quite came back. I think it's sort of spread around. But also, very importantly, in film and TV, it exists in the memory of the audience. And I'm not being sort of peculiar about this. I aim to get it to a point where, where the person watching has believed it, it's worked as a character. It's not foam, latex, steel, rods, uh, papier-mâché, bits of rubber. It's in the memory of the, you know, the mind of the audience. Uh, I do have a barn full of stuff, which I really should get rid of. A lot of it is deteriorating badly, but I find it very hard to let go of some of these things. You know, they are totems to my life and to my family, and I have memory of all those bits. There's very little that I've ever kept. I had a Batman suit for a long time, uh, and everybody who came to the house would wear it. It got very tatty. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, we had a question about smell uh, in the previous session, so uh, yeah, we, we won't go in. We won't go there. But uh, well, after what you saw, us uh, clearly there are so many different versions of some. I of think that, smell uh, is an creature. important point. So actually, when I am trying to create belief within actors for film and television, I do bring smells on board sometimes, and I certainly talk about that. Like, what is it you're sensing in this? relationship. So to, to get a, a, a sense of things, you know, that there's sound, there's peripheral sound and the immediate thing. So you react, your brain goes to that. But a, a sense of smell can be so evocative of a thing, or it can tell you, don't step in that. <laughs> and yes, I, you know, I, I bring things on <laughs> up to the point that I'm allowed to in order to get the moment. It's just achieving the beat. I can imagine certain things you couldn't bring in in your bag, <laughs> smell-wise, I mean. Um, uh, Teresa asks, uh, do you plan the different puppets needed beforehand, or do they organically present themselves as acquired uh, during filming? I mean, this is a very important, thank you, that's a great question. In that I need on the day to have control so that then those, the moments of beauty can happen, the creativity can happen because all the things are there. And I will spend months developing, uh, well, for instance, with dark materials, we had the scripts. Uh, I had a basic understanding of the sort of things I wanted to provide. We'd have the designs of the demons, the different iterations of those. Uh, let's say Pantalime is probably 16 different uh, versions within that first series. Uh, you build a sort of basic puppet of that, uh, which it would be a stuffy that uh, Lara could cuddle. There would be uh, a proxy version, so a gray one that would be just a bit smaller than the real CG thing. So that could be moved through shots. There'd be an animated version proxy that would jump around and be the eye lines. Uh, there might be just a wire one, which would be there so the camera could see through it but it could give the eye line, you know, everything was worked out. 
And it was done probably at a round table, which included the executive producer, the designer, the VFX supervisor, VFX artists, uh, the costume person. You know, all these people were at the table to decide how you'd be able to navigate through with a storyboard and you're supplying the thing you need for the storyboard. Now, this is very specific to film and television, mm -hmm. I'd say, uh, but control is critical to allow fluidity. So I'm just going to do a little Welsh poetic thing. Please excuse me, everybody. But if you look to your woods, uh, to a tree, you'll see that the roots are deep into the ground and strong and the trunk is moving up and it's there and exists, but the branches and the twigs at the end all move with the wind. And I think that's pretty much how I approach projects for film and television, that you need good roots, solid trunk, got it all in place. And then when the wind rustles your leaves, you're able to react. That's absolutely magnificent, Todd. I love that. Uh, um, I, I was looking at, um, I was looking at the time actually. And I, I think that because we've got, uh, uh, Howard is going to be coming in at three o'clock. I, yeah. I think we'd probably better gradually uh, sort of move towards the end. But uh, I, I did want to say what an absolutely stunning interview. What a fantastic uh, question and answer session and how lovely it was. Uh, again, uh, it's the second time that I've heard the beautiful eloquence of your Welsh tongue. Uh, and and it, it, I think everyone's appreciated that hugely. It's, it's, it's been wonderful to listen to you, Todd. Thank you so much for being part of this and for sharing your experiences and for sharing the links with us as well. Um, Hello everyone and from now and now. And I'd also say the pleasure of chatting with Terry, you know, I'd happily do that anytime. Thank you so much. Everybody uh, who's here, please uh, join us uh, for the next phase of fantasy and puppetry, which will be taking place uh, at three o'clock uh, at, uh, at the next link. And that will be with Howard Gayton Puppeteer, who will be talking to us about bringing creatures to life in the theater. <laughs> Good, bye.